you can open at Ephesians chapter 3. One thing that was quite interesting uh, to me when we uh, moved to the UK is there's uh, something that's quite big in the UK, and that is murder mysteries. Um, it uh, it's, it's, was something to get used to. Uh, the first I saw a banner um, advertising a murder mystery dinner, and I thought, what could this be? And I read up about it. Uh, I actually want to attend one, uh, one evening um, at some stage, but... Uh, it's, it's a dinner where you go to the dinner um, and then you become part of this whole murder mystery uh, and you uh, try and solve this murder mystery. There are actors normally around and uh, maybe you become one of them uh, also. Um, and there's this competition who can solve that uh, mystery first. Um, one of uh, our favorite murder mysteries uh, to watch is Midsummer Murders. And... Um, those of you uh, who have seen it uh, will know there's usually there's a murder or there's, there's a range of murders and DCI Barnaby comes on stage and uh, he tries to fit the pieces together and solve uh, the murder. And throughout uh, the whole episode, um, there are subtle hints dropped uh, who is the guilty party. And me and my wife normally have a competition which she uh, unfortunately wins most of the time is who, who can identify the murderer first. Now, usually how the, these stories work is um, you are dropped subtle hints uh, throughout the story, but right at the end, there's this big revelation, uh, a big clue that's coming or a big revelation, and the murderer is then apprehended and um, arrested. Now, when we get back to our text, the one word that sort of pops out uh, in this passage is the word mystery. Mystery. Now, Mystery uh, in the English language can mean something that's sort of hidden, that uh, you, you don't understand too well, uh, but that's not really what's meant here. What Paul means by mystery is something that was hidden in past ages, but now has been made manifest. It's made, it's made known. It's been revealed. And we'll see what that is. Now, just to understand our text um, and the structure of our text, uh, look at verse 1. Paul writes, he says, For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, uh, for you Gentiles. And then there's a hyphen. And then go down all the way to verse 14. He says again, For this reason, I bow my knees. You see, he repeats himself. So what Paul was doing, he was starting to write the prayer that he wanted to pray that we can read about from verse 15 of chapter 3 to the end of the chapter. So Paul wanted to pray, but as he was going into his prayer, he thought, no, I, I need to give them more information. I, I want to tell them something more. And so this whole section from verse 2 to verse 13 is basically Paul's interruption before he prays. He interrupted himself. He wanted to share something more that he didn't share before. Now, those of you who can still remember, I think it was November last year, um, I preached on the last part of chapter 2, and that was all about how the Gentiles, in other words, the non-Jews, were included in God, uh, as part of God's people in the church. We'll see a bit more about that uh, tonight. Maybe I'll also keep it as a bit of a mystery. And... Um, uh, keep, keep you glued to your seats. Uh, but um, what Paul is saying here is, I want to pray for you, but before I, I can pray, I want to share something that's in my heart. And, and we see here Paul sharing something of himself, bearing his heart to the congregation, giving us some personal information for the first time in this letter. I mean, this whole letter is quite a warm letter. It's written um, deep theology of how uh, people are saved through the gospel and how the church works and how God's plan works and all of this. But Paul didn't really get personal until now. He really gets personal. And we will see what details Paul uh, diverge in this uh, passage that can be helpful to us. So, 
as we uh, work through or, or want to understand this uh, passage, I thought to slice the passage in two separate parts. And it won't be um, uh, uh, verse for verse going through uh, this. I'm going to take one theme, and that is Paul the man. Who did Paul reveal? Uh, what did Paul reveal about himself, and what can we learn from that? So that will be our first heading, Paul the man. And then secondly, we'll look at Paul's message. What was the message that Paul was so passionate about that he was happy to suffer uh, for that um, message? So, very easy, two, two headings. And we're going to uh, look at the first one, Paul the man. Paul the man. So, it starts right after in verse 1 of chapter 3. And they're all going to start with a P, by the way. And the first one is Paul the prisoner. We're going to look at Paul the prisoner. Now, Paul was writing this letter being probably in prison in Rome. Now, how did, how did Paul get into prison? We can read all about that in Acts chapter 21. Let me uh, remind you a little bit about that. So, Paul, on his third missionary journey, he returned to Jerusalem and wanting to visit the church there. He was warned not to go there because the Jews will arrest him. We will see why they arrested him a bit later. So Paul uh, uh, went into uh, Jerusalem announcing that there's been a big shift in God's plan. A big shift. In other words, that the, God's people it will not only be the Jews anymore, he's including Gentiles. And the Jews hated that message. They still wanted to be God's physical people. They were not very much open to allow Gentiles in, but it went even further, as we will see later. So in Acts 21, Paul went into Jerusalem. He went into the temple with some other people. And then, as he got into the temple, the Jews um, dragged him outside. They dragged him outside and they started beating him. They, they were busy murdering him until the, the Roman commander intervened. He sent soldiers in and they basically re rescued Paul's life. Paul, they were, uh, I think Paul was probably quite badly beaten already by the time the Roman authorities came in and uh, saved Paul. And then they seized him, and they arrested him, and they threw him in prison. Paul then, uh, uh, you can read about that uh, further on in Acts, from Acts 21 all the way to the end. Paul is on his way to Rome to see Caesar and because he appealed to Caesar. So this was the reason Paul was in Rome. And we see there, he says, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles. It's because, uh, and, and we also need to remember that the church in Ephesus was mostly Gentile believers. In other words, non-Jewish believers. That Paul said, I'm, I'm a prisoner for you Gentiles because of the message that I, that I declare of including you, uh, the Gentiles, in God's plan. But look what he said. He says, I am a prisoner of Christ Jesus. You see, Paul did not see himself as a prisoner of Rome or even a prisoner thanks to these bad Jewish guys. Paul says, no, I believe in God's sovereignty in my life. I believe I'm a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul believed that his life was still in God's hands, that God had a plan with his life, even though he was locked up in prison. Now, Christian, is that the way that you see your life? Whether you are a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer or a stay-at-home mom or a school pupil or a, a, a somebody that's retired, of Jesus Christ, of Jesus Christ. Do you believe that in whichever circumstance you find yourself in, like Paul, Paul, uh, the, the prisons back then weren't particularly good places to go to, but Paul was still seeing himself firmly in Christ's hands. He said, I am a prisoner of my Lord Jesus Christ. It was, yes, it was the Jews that, that wanted to kill me. Yes, the Romans uh, uh, arrested me. Uh, I'm locked up, but ultimately Jesus and is sovereign. God is sovereign in our lives. So this is the first very important thing that we learn about Paul, how he defined himself as a prisoner. 
So let me encourage you that wherever you find yourself this afternoon, whether in good circumstances or not so good, whether you know it's uh, uh, something uh, that's temporary or it's permanent, I have confidence in this Christian that your life is in Jesus' hands. So this is what we can learn about Paul, the prisoner. So that's the first P in verse 1. The second one is Paul, the privileged. Paul, the privileged. How can I say that? I mean, Paul was in prison. How can I say he was privileged? It's there in verse 3. He says, Paul says, How that by revelation, ye, that's God, he made known to me the mystery. So Paul was the recipient of a direct revelation from God. Paul is saying this message that I'm preaching, and think about that now, uh, go back 2,000 years. They didn't have the Bible, they had the Old Testament. So, it's only the Old Testament. There were some manuscripts doing the rounds about Jesus and Jesus' life. And Paul is saying, what I'm telling you has been revealed to me directly by God himself. It's not words that I've made up. God revealed them to me. How did God reveal it to Paul? We don't know for sure. We don't know for sure exactly how it could have been on, his, on the Damascus Road when Paul was miraculously converted, as you remember. It could have been at some other occasion. We don't know. But what Paul is saying is God made a direct revelation to me. So Paul was immensely privileged, immensely privileged. We can see that there in verse 7. He says, um, this message, this mystery of Christ that he calls it, he says, of which I became a minister according to the gift of grace of God given to me. Gift of grace. It's a wonderful gift that God has given me, this message, this direct revelation. Now, in a sense, all Christians are as privileged as Paul are, or even more privileged, because we've got the whole of Scripture. We've got God's full revelation written down for us. We even have more than that. We've got 2,000 years of church history. How the church battled with, with the truths of Scripture that we can use to guide us in understanding this word. This is why I commended the 1689 Baptist Confession. We know that almost 500 years ago, there was a group of believers who battled through and wrestled with the truths of the Bible. And they wrote it down, and we still have access to that. So just as Paul was privileged to receive this direct revelation of God, so each and every Christian is privileged to have God's revelation written down. We also have this immense privilege to be able to listen to God's word being preached every Sunday. Now, the question is, what do we do with this revelation? What do we do with this revelation? Do we really use it? Do we do what Paul did? And that brings me to the third P of Paul. And that is Paul the preacher. That is what Paul did with the message. He preached it. He preached it. He proclaimed it. Um, the word there in verse 8 says to me, who am less than the least of the saints, this grace was given that I should preach, preach among the Gentiles. Now that word preach is actually the word evangelize. It means to announce or to proclaim God's message. It means to go to a certain, to a certain place with a certain audience and announce good news, good news from God. And Paul was proclaiming this good news, as we see uh, in, the, in the Acts of the Apostles, to Jews and especially now to Gentiles. He's saying there in the second part of verse 8, he's, he's saying that I should preach among the Gentiles. But we also know that he was preaching among the Jews. He preached it everywhere, everywhere where he could. Now this fact that Paul had this special revelation and that he was a preacher, did that make Paul arrogant? Did that make him think that He's a little bit better than the others. He's a little bit more learned or a little bit better 
No, far from it. We see that in verse 8. He says, to me who am less than the least of all the saints. Paul was an immensely humble man. Paul was intensely aware of his shortcomings that he himself had. Paul was immensely aware of his past, where he persecuted the church of God, and then God intervened to save his life. Paul was extremely, um, just a, a, a note on, the, on there where it says, who am less than the least of all the saints. The Greek meaning is actually small, small, little. Now, some commentators uh, um, say it, it, it could have been a little bit of a joke there because uh, in Latin, Paulos means small. And according to the tradition, Paul was a small, quite a, sh a short man. Don't know if that's true, but according to the tradition. So Paul is saying, my surname is short, I'm short, and in stature I'm actually also short because I persecuted the church of God. He was intensely aware of his checkered past. But Paul also proclaimed his message with authority. So Paul was bold to, to proclaim this message. He was not just humble, but he was also bold in a sense. And here we need to learn where did Paul's boldness come from. Paul's boldness was in his message and not in himself as a person. Paul knew that as a man himself, he's a sinner, desperately in need of grace. Desperately in need of grace. But the message he proclaims is from God himself. And I think in a sense, this is true for all of us, isn't it? If we teach this Christian message, if we teach this gospel, if we either preach it or we teach it to our children or we discuss it with family or a work colleague or a neighbor, we should be humble in presenting the gospel. Always be humble. Because we know that in and of ourselves, we are nothing. We are Poor sinners. But at the same time, we should also be bold. We should also have courage, not in ourselves, in our own abilities, but in the message itself. And that brings the focus. When we teach, uh, uh, when we teach the word, when we proclaim the gospel, it bring, makes the focus in the message and not in us. What do I mean with that? What I mean with that is we need to be faithful to the message because the message is what comes from God directly. But at the same time, when we are courteous and humble in presenting it, we know that the authority lies in the message himself. And that is something that Paul was intensely aware of as we see there in verse 8. So, I think we can all desire to grow both in humility on the one hand, but also in boldness and confidence in the other. Let's look at the next P. The next P is Paul the persecuted. Paul the persecuted. Now, this wonderful privilege that Paul had of having this direct revelation from God and being able to preach God's message also came with persecution. We already, we've already seen that he was in prison. But that is not all. If you look there in verse, um, verse 13, he said, Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you. There Paul is talking about him being persecuted for this message, not just in prison. If you go and you read... Uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 11. Paul gives his persecution CV there. It's a long list of things that he suffered for the gospel. And he mentions imprisonment, he mentions beatings. I mean, five times he was beaten, 39 lashes. Five times. Can you imagine? Five times. He was stoned, 
He suffered hunger. He suffered thirst. He was shipwrecked twice. So Paul was a persecuted man for this message that he was preaching. He was persecuted. And I think in a sense, still in today's secular world, in today's world, that's uh, many times it's hostile to the gospel. When we evangelize, when we preach this message, sometimes when we even let slip that we are a Christian at work or wherever we are, we can also suffer persecution. Not luckily in a sense that Paul did, even though there are many millions of Christians today being imprisoned, being beaten, being killed for, for being Christians. We thank God for the freedoms that we have in this country. But yet, there, there are still consequences when we tell people we are Christians or when we try to evangelize. Things that, like being laughed at or being the butt of, of jokes, say, oh, here comes the religious guy. We better, we better uh, put together our act now. Or being ridiculed. Even being isolated. Maybe you're in school or you're at university and you struggle to find friends because you're a Christian. And other, uh, and other secular people don't really want to relate with you. It can even be more serious like losing out on a promotion. Or not being offered a job. Because you believe in God and His word. Sometimes we have to say no to a lot of things. Maybe uh, events happening on Sundays where we say no, we, we rather want to go to church and participate in these events. But we know from, uh, from the scripture, from the New Testament, that Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. We know that uh, suffering and being persecuted is part and, and parcel of the package of being a believer. But there's one thing that Paul mentions in that um, suffering CV of, of, of him in uh, 2 Corinthians 11 that he said was the worst of all of it. And those of you who know, can you remember what it was? It wasn't his imprisonment. It wasn't his beatings. It wasn't um, hunger, cold. It was none of those things. He mentions my deep concern for all the churches. For him, that was the worst that he suffered. He had this concern for the churches. That, that the churches he planted, that the churches he came to know would prosper. That's why we have all these letters written to the churches. It came out of that concern that Paul had for the churches. And that brings us to the final P. And that's Paul the pastor. Paul the pastor. And that's in verse 13. He says, Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. What Paul is saying is, don't worry about me being in prison. I am more concerned how my sufferings will affect you. I'm more concerned about how you would handle all the sufferings that I'm uh, going through. He was more concerned about the church than about his own situation. If there was something that truly shows Paul's pastoral heart, it's this, that the man writing from prison say, I am worried how this can affect you as a church. Maybe my imprisonment is discouraging you, and I don't want you to be discouraged. Paul was totally selfless. Totally selfless. He had more concern for the church than for his uh, own life. That begs the question is, if we think of Paul's pastoral heart, we need to ask ourselves, how concerned are we for the well-being of God's people in the church? How concerned are we really? I mean, do we care enough to regularly pray for one another? Do we search for ways we can serve one another, maybe in small practical ways? Are we really concerned for the well-being of others around us in the church? 
I think all of us can learn something from Paul's example here in verse 13 of how to be totally selfless, how to put others' needs above our own. So this is something that Paul revealed about himself, something that we could learn, that Paul was a prisoner of Christ, that he was privileged to receive God's revelation. He was a preacher. He proclaimed God's message openly and boldly, even though he was a humble man. And Paul was persecuted for this message. The last one is Paul was a pastor. He was a real pastor, and he had a deep concern for the church's well-being. Now let's go to the second part, Paul's message. What was Paul's message? What is this mystery that we have learned about and that we've seen so prominently in this passage? So, and here is the mystery. This is now the part where, if you think of Midsummer Murders, where the big revelation is coming. I hope you're ready. So, when we look back at the events in the Old Testament, we see a lot of glimpses of what Paul was saying. So first of all, I'll say you what this mystery was not. The mystery was not the fact that Gentiles would have been included or saved by God, merely that. It was more than that. I mean, we see in the, in the Old Testament so many times that God promised that He would include um, Gentile believers um, in, uh, uh, as His people. We see that, for example, let me uh, give you a few examples. In Isaiah, Isaiah 49 verse 6, Isaiah is talking about Jesus. He's saying, I will also give you, you uh, meaning Jesus, as a light to the Gentiles. There it was quite clear that Jesus would be a light to the Gentiles. That he would uh, um, say that you sh should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. So it was no surprise to the, uh, to, to the Jews of the time that Jesus would also include non-believers. I mean, we even saw that in the, uh, God's covenant with Abraham. He said, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And so there are many more examples. So that was not really a surprise. What was so radical about Paul's message? And here comes the mystery. And it was this, that not only would Gentiles be added to God's people being saved, but also that Israel as a nation would lose their significance as God's only special people. That was the radicalness of Paul's message, that the nation Israel would no longer be the nation under God's rule who will have a special place uh, to worship a special land, the, 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 the physical land of Israel, and this whole sacrificial system and everything, all of that would come to an end now. Jesus brought all of that to an end because Jesus came to fulfill all of that and he initiated a new era, a completely new covenant. God in this new dispensation that we see have now replaced Israel, the nation Israel, the physical Israel, with something brand new. And that's called the church. The church. God established a completely new community. Yes, made up of believing Jews as well, but also made up of all people over the whole world who would come and put their faith in the Lord Jesus. Think about that. Put yourself for a moment in the shoes of the non-believing first century Jew, knowing that Israel was occupied by the Romans. They expected God to send a Savior that would save Israel from the Romans. And here's this guy coming to say, oh, all of that has come to an end. God is starting a new community that would not have grand buildings and land and riches. No, God is establishing a church that will consist of all of those that will put their faith in the Lord Jesus. That was the radicalness of Paul's message. 
That was why he was so hated by the non-believing Jews. I mean, see there in verse 6, uh, Paul says, he says, the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, through the good news. And then Paul describes this new community, this uh, new community God is forming. We've seen that in uh, the latter part of uh, chapter 2. Paul is emphasizing it here. He's saying it in verse 10. He says, to the intent that now, in verse 10, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. Might be made known. The manifold wisdom. Now that word manifold, manifold wisdom, it can mean multifaceted or multicolored. When... um, when they translated uh, the Old Testament into Greek about 300 years before Jesus. Do you know this same uh, Greek word was used to describe Joseph's multicolored coat that he wore in the Old Testament? So what Paul is saying, the church would be multicolored, multifaceted. It would consist of all sorts of people, people from different cultures, different tribes, different languages, from all over. It will be multicolored, multifaceted. That's how the church would look like. It will not be just one nation, a Jewish nation. In the Old Testament, if you wanted to be, uh, become a believer, you had to become a Jew. Not anymore. God formed the church. The, church. the only entrance requirement is faith in our Lord Jesus, faith in the gospel. This church, this um, manifold, multicolored church would proclaim the wisdom of God. How would they do that, do you think? How would they proclaim God's wisdom? Well, by simply being the church. I mean, if we just look at us here, present, we are from different uh, cultures, different countries, different languages, but we are all one. In Christ. We are united in Christ, in the gospel. That is what the church is communicating to the world. It's communicating God's wisdom. It made me think of the Tower of Babel. When all these uh, people were scattered because of their languages. God is reversing that through the church already now. He's reversing that. He's bringing people together. We've got nothing in common except Christ. Nothing except Jesus Christ. That is their unity. And we see that. I mean, is the church perfect? Far from it. Unfortunately, we see many times the church being divided. But if we just look at our own church, if we look at the various gospel churches around Derby, if we look at what's happening across the world, I think there is lots to celebrate for the unity of God's church and the progress being made for God's church. Now this word here, church, in verse 10, if you look at to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church, can also be translated by the congregation. So it can mean the church universal throughout the world, but it can also mean the local congregation. And we see that so wonderfully displayed, even in our own congregation. It's so wonderful to see how all the different people from uh, different countries, different languages, different cultures, God is bringing together multi, multicolored, multifaceted, like a tapestry of different colors being woven together. So, what does it mean um, there in the latter part of verse 10? It says that this manifold wisdom of God might be known, made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. What does that mean? Just uh, keep your finger here and page to chapter 6. Ephesians 6 verse 12. Uh, Richard preached uh, through this not too long ago. I'll just uh, remind you there. Um, where Paul says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against 
principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. You can page back. What Paul is saying here is this unity that's displayed in the church, this unity being um, people made up of different tribes, cultures, languages, all coming together as one, it's showing to, go, to the church's enemies that they would be defeated. This is the principalities and the powers. It means Satan and his demons are watching on as the church unifies, as the church makes progress through the gospel. And it's almost like God is showing these enemies, your defeat is certain. Your defeat is certain. The enemies of the church will be finally defeated, but the church is the place where it's shown to, the, to, to, to all these enemies that they will be defeated. That's what verse 10 says. He says, this unity of the church is made known. I mean, think about it. Satan and his demons, there's nothing they like more than sowing, sowing division. Nothing they like more. That's always their point of attack. In the church, they sow division, sow division. But where the church is united, where we see this new community forming, new churches being planted, gospel progress being made, it reminds the devil and his demons that their demise is sure, that they will be totally defeated when Christ comes and he gathers his elect from all corners of the earth. I think when we look at Paul's message of salvation in Jesus Christ. As he says so beautifully there in um, verse 12, he says, uh, in Jesus, whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. I think the application is quite simple for us. And it's Christian, how central is the church in your own life? The church the church is the place where God gathers His people. Many people make a lot of um, emphasis or put a lot of emphasis on their personal salvation, which is rightly so. Yes, we are saved from sin, and we are saved individual, uh, individually as individuals. We all have to encounter Jesus ourselves individually. But there's a very much a corporate dimension to our salvation. A corporate dimension, meaning what are we saved into? We saved from our sin. We are saved by faith in Jesus. But what are we saved into? We are saved into the church. That's the, almost the horizontal dimension. We are saved into the church. And this has got loads of practical implications for our lives. The first one is, if you are not a member of a, of a church, you need to be one, <laughs> if you're a Christian. If you're not a member of a church, you need to be one. Or maybe uh, your work situation and things uh, work out that you need to move somewhere else. What's the first thing that you do when you have to move into a new area? You look for a faithful biblical church. What do you do if there is none? Don't move. <laughs> Don't move. Prayerfully consider moving if you have to go to a place where there's no faithful biblical church. If it's within your power, obviously. If it's within your power. But the church should be central in our thinking. And our connection to the church should be central in our thinking as Christians. I just had to quote... Uh, one of my um, theological heroes on this, I couldn't resist, um, John Stott, and he writes uh, this. He says, If the church is central to God's purpose, it must surely also be central to our lives. How can we take lightly what God takes so seriously? How dare we push to the circumference 
what God placed at the center. No, we shall seek to become responsible church members, active in some local manifestation of the universal church. So think about that, active in some local manifestation, active in the local church. Now, if anyone is listening to this message and you're not a Christian, let me invite you to become one. Let me invite you to put your faith in Jesus, as it says there in verse 12. In Jesus, we have boldness and access, access to God with confidence through faith in Him. That's how we become Christians. And let me encourage you then to become a member of the church. If you are a member already, think about how you can grow your involvement with the church. Maybe in small, small ways, small yet significant ways, we can grow our involvement in the church. Let me give you some examples. Um, how about being more hospitable and from time to time open your house? To others in the church, inviting others over to your church or to your house. How about to meet up with others in the church? Maybe go for a walk or do shopping together. Just spend time, try and spend time with those in the church. Or to pray with others or read a, a book together. Or just make an effort after the service to talk to somebody you don't know that well. It can be as small as that. Even helping visitors in the church feel welcome. As we look to Paul's life, as we've seen, and especially at his message about God and his purposes in the church, let's thank God for his revelation to us. Let's thank God that we can see what he's doing in the world. We can really thank God for Paul's life and his example if God could use Paul so mightily, think about where Paul was. If he could use Paul so mightily, he can use each and every one of us also. Let's consider these words. And then next time, so this, this time we, we looked at how Paul interrupted himself. Next time we'll look at the prayer. He eventually uh, gets to pray uh, from verse 15 uh, to the end of the chapter. So next time we'll look at his prayer. So, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your revelation in your word. Lord, we thank you that we've got everything we need for life and godliness. All of that in your word. And we thank you, Lord, that we can learn from your servant Paul, that we could learn from your redemptive purposes, your saving purposes through the church. Oh Lord, help us to live our lives with the church being central in our lives. Lord, help us not to forsake our gatherings together. Lord, help us to grow in our faithfulness in serving others in your church. Lord, please be with each and every one of us in this coming week whether we work or go to school, Lord, or whatever we do, please help us, Lord. But more than that, please help us to seek your presence, as we heard about this morning. Lord, please help us to appreciate your church in a new and fresh way. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.